Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence. We are honored and privileged today. And, and Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Humble me and speak through me so that your people will listen and receive words from you, not from me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Manona do sikerit. In fact, I want to demand that you want sikerit. I'm just about to say over so. Have you ever been in a place, country, or just any situation where you couldn't understand anything at all? Well, I just speak in Malagasy, which is a language, a real language, <laughs> from Madagascar. And let me tell you something today. In the very limited time that I've been here on earth, I have observed that communication plays a big role in our daily life. You know, when I wrote this sentence, I said, oh, I was laughing because uh, it seemed to me like when, when I wrote the sentence, it sounds like I was one of these scientists, scientists who had made a very huge discovery, like, I have observed, okay, I have observed that communication, actually, it's like, a, it's like a new discovery, but actually, I'm sure you agree with me, that communication plays a big role in our daily life. It's hard to deny that even in the womb, we strive to understand, but also to be understood. Infant, child, teenager, young adult, adult, seniors, we are all using verbal and nonverbal ways to communicate our thoughts and feelings, our thoughts and feelings which define our relationship with one another, but also with God. The sermon today is entitled, Communicate, Communicate, Communicate. Unfortunately, many conversations can be compared to a tennis match. Have you ever watched a tennis match? I know one of my friends here, Joel Loiza, loves tennis. Where are you? Okay. Unfortunately, brother, many conversations can be compared to a tennis match. Why? Two players standing on opposite, so opposite ends of the court, preparing to send the ball across the net in such a way that the other has little or no chance of a successful return. You guys get that? In a tennis match, you have, you're supposed to push the ball across the net, and you have to... Uh, do it very well so that the other side will not be able to return it. The goal is not to keep the, ba the ball going back and forth between them, but to deliver the ball so as to prevent a response. But I'd like to suggest today that our conversation, our communication, should be more uh, uh, represented by a, a game of a catch. So I'd like to ask one young people right now to come up here. <laughs> Who? A volunteer. A volunteer. Okay. All right, come on. Come on up. Uh, who was first? Okay. All right. Okay. Can the church say amen? Yeah, we love our young people, we support them. All right, so I have something in my pocket here, okay? What's your name again? Gabriel. Say again? Gabriel. 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 Can everybody say hi, Gabriel? Hi, Gabriel. All right, so I have this ball here, Gabriel. Yes, I, I still have the ball. And I'm, I'm going to throw it to you, and you're going to try to catch it, okay? Is that all right? Okay, all right, let's go. Oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And now you're gonna throw it to me and I'll try to catch it. All right, once again. All right, once again. All right, once again. All right, there we go. There we go. Thank you, Gabriel. Everybody say thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel. Our communication. Thank you, Gabriel. You can, you can take your seat. 
Our communication should be an exchange where someone throws, throws the ball to someone and someone catches it and someone expects to receive that ball. Not like in tennis, Joel, <laughs> but like in catch. So come with me today as we travel back in time to get some advice about communication in the story recorded in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 from the verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 6 from the verse 15. And I want to thank Joy for reading this text earlier. 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 16. If you're there, please say amen. amen. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Notice that it's not the first time you hear this verse from my sermon. This is the same text, actually, that we saw the last time I stood here. But I thank God that his words contain more truths that cannot be preached or shared in one single sermon. So last time we saw an exposition of the passage. This is our teaching moment, teaching rubric of the sermon. Last time we saw an exposition of the passage. The sermon last time was was is also known as an expository sermon where we go to the text and I exposed the text and we draw some lessons from the text. Are we still together? Today we would look at, at a particular theme in the, in the passage and we'll go rather everywhere in the Bible and try to get some lessons and an understanding from that which means this is rather a topical, a topical study of the Bible. As an example, we can choose a topic like marriage, and we can go all over the Bible and find texts about marriage and then draw lessons about marriage. However, I must admit that this method is very dangerous. If you've been studying the Bible this way, it's very dangerous. By isolating the text, a text, because of a theme, we can miss its real meaning in its context. So that's why when you have a topical study, you have to be sure that the text that you choose has the meaning of the theme that you are, that the topic that you took, which means you have to study the context of the text. Okay, that was the end of the boring part of the sermon. Okay, that was just a bunch of, uh, you know, <laughs> very academic thing, okay? But let's go back to the text. Let's go back to the text. And when the servant of the man of God arose, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city which horse, with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? The word servant here, that's the first thing we see. The word servant here means assistant or helper. The word also suggests that this character, the servant, is younger than the master. So in this context, there is a younger, young man talking to an older man. So this relationship, this interaction here, is it, is it a relevant theme in this book? And yes, it is. Actually, it's the same relationship that we, we see with Elijah and Elijah. Elijah called Elisha. And now Elisha was mentored by Elijah. So there was an interaction there between a younger and an older generation, if I, if I, if I can say that, if you, if you may. A relationship or mentorship or even parenthood between a younger generation and an older generation of prophets is a relevant theme in the two books of Kings. 
So when this young man saw the problem, he went to his master. And let me repeat again, the young man was younger than the master. So my first recommendation today, church, is for us young people. When we have a problem, talk to our parents. Go to your parents. Talk with them. Share them the problem. Share, share with them, like, hey, I have this problem. I, I, I can't figure out how to do well in school. Or I, I have this hard decision that I have to take, and I can't, I, I can't figure out how to take it. Can you please help me? Now, I understand that they may not understand totally, the parents may not understand totally the way you see the problem, but please let them know. God has placed parents in our lives to guide us and to reassure us. As you will see in this story today, the, the older man of the characters, the older of the characters will give reassurance and will really help this young man. He went out, he saw a problem, and he went back to this prophet. I know some of us young people are worried that we would get in trouble if we tell our parents what really is going on in our life. How would they react? Would they overreact? Would they be hurt? The Bible says in Luke 8, 8 verse 17, that there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. So hey guys, the parents will know anyway, anyhow. I'm, I'm speaking from, from experience. <laughs> they will know, they know what you're doing. They will know what you're doing. They will know what we are doing. So instead of hiding, let's go to the parents and tell them. That's the first lesson and recommendation of, of, of the sermon today, which is found in this story. This young man, he saw a problem, and he immediately went back inside and talked to this man who is full of experience. The way Proverbs 12, 15 said, because sometimes, before I say this text, sometimes we think that it's better to not say, because, you know, something might happen. Okay, but you know what? The way of a fool seems right to him, says Proverbs 12, verse, verse 15. But a wise man listens to advice. If we want to get some advice, we need to share our problem. That sounds logical, right? Yeah. If we want to get advice about something, you've got to share that problem, that something, so that someone will, get, get, will give you an advice. The glory of young men is their strength, says Proverbs 20, 29. And the honor of old men is their gray hair. Their gray hair means that they have experience. They've been there, been there, done that. They've been there, so don't worry. Go and talk. First recommendation, value your parents' presence. Value your parents' experience. Amen? All right. However, I know, I have to say today, I know that having parents to whom you can talk to is not a reality for everybody. And that's a reality. Because of sin, there are parents in this world, and I don't think we have them in this church, but there are parents who mistreat their children because of some unresolved personal issues. But like this young man here in this story, God has placed people with whom we can talk to in our, in our surrounding. Pastors, elders, or even just someone whom you trust. Pray, young people. Let's pray. So that we will, so that God will give us the right person, a trustworthy person to talk to. But to get some advice about your problem, you gotta have to share it. You gotta have to share it. So value your parents' presence. 
value your parents' experience. Value your elders' presence. Value your elders' experience. But the story continues. It's not, the story doesn't end there. Actually, we're going to go to verse 16. And if you're still in 2 Kings, it's just a verse under 15. So verse 16. So he, what's the word here? Answered. So he answered. He here represents the prophet. He answered. The only reason why he could answer to this problem is because he paid attention to what the young man said. Okay? My second recommendation today is to other parents. Be aware of what's going on in the young people's life, in our lives. Be aware of what's going on. If you're not aware, you will not be able to give some advice. However, there is a very important ingredient to this communication between parents and children, and that is trust. You have to be trustworthy as parents if you want us young people to talk to you. How can you be trustworthy? And we're going to talk about that. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Parenthood is such an amazing uh, um, job, but it's a full-time job. And you might think, oh, who is this young man talking about parenthood? <laughs> but I think I can talk about it just a little bit. I have a lot of theories and a very little tiny experience. But, but Ellen G. White says that God has given parents their work to form the characters of their children after the divine pattern. She says, it's a divine responsibility. If you have a somewhat terrible relationship with your kids, God is calling you back today that you are responsible and that it is a divine responsibility to educate your child. And not only to parents, but to us elders, to us uh, pastors. As leaders, we have a divine responsibility by His grace, by whose grace? By Jesus' grace, by God's grace. They, the parents, the elders, those who have more experience in life, can accomplish this task, this divine task. But it will require patience. Painstaking effort and no less than firmness and decision to guide the will and restrain the passions. We have our own personality as parents, as, as, as leaders, and we need patience. As someone comes to us, as, as, as a teenager comes to you and just tells you about all these, these things that somehow you understand a little bit, uh, just a little bit of it, and you have, you have to be patient. Patience has to be there to try to understand. And actually, I'm just going to give you 10, 10 T's today, and you can take notes. 10 T's of how you should communicate with your child or with your um, mentee or with your student. The first one is taking notice. What is it, everybody? Taking notice. Be aware. Notice their clothes, hair, hairstyles, nonverbal communication, friends, interests, change in habits, temperament, feelings, music, TV programs, video games. Notice what's going on. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. That's our responsibility. Are you aware of, of what's going on in their lives? If you consider yourself as parent, are you aware of their, this might be a little bit um, awkward, but are, are you aware of their email, their words, their attitudes, their behaviors, their grades, hangouts? In other words, are you aware? Are you involved? Are you aware of what's going on in their life? Are you fully aware? Next one, talking. 
What is the next one again? Talking. talking. The first one was? Taking. taking notice. The second one is talking. And talking, uh, actually, this one is more of a listening than talking. But we included in this T because I had to find another word with T. Uh, talking includes listening. And it's listening about their feelings, their thoughts, their opinions, their joys, their hurts, the random stuff, sexuality, finances, right from wrong. Nothing is off limits. Talking with, with lots of listening communicates warmth. You are there. You care. Your presence. I ask the young people today to value your presence as, as parents, your experience. I'm asking you to make them feel that you are present. Talk with them. Listen. Are you aware? Have you heard about life? Are you aware of what's going on in life? Are you supporting the young people in their decision of, leave, or, or, of living a life in faith every day? Are you aware of that? You know, most of the time, I always hear this. I'm too old for that. I'm too old for this. I'm too old for that. I'm too old for this. I'm too old here. I'm too old there. I'm too old here and there. What is that song? <laughs> here and there with Moo Moo something. <laughs> the children's song. But we need to be involved in our young people's life. Make them feel that you're present. Make them know. Tell them that you support them. Tell them. Tell us. <laughs> Not say them. I'm young. Tell us. That you are here with us, that you support us, that you're going to help us, that you're going to guide us, that you're going to reassure us in every problem we are facing. Next one. Another T. Truth. Okay, the first one was? You take notice. The second one was? Talking. And third one is now? Truth. Tell your children the truth about God. First of all, about God. They are hearing a lot of stuff. We are hearing a lot of stuff about God in school, in, 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 in the street, with our friends. Tell us about God. Who is this God that we believe in? Then tell us the truth about morality, how we should preserve ourselves. Tell us the truth about you, parents. Tell us the truth about you. Who are you? What are you to us? Tell us the truth about the world around us so that we are aware of what's going on. And actually, if we go back to the text, we can see that in this text. As the old man, the prophet is telling, do not worry, reassuring. But then, you know, the reality is that these soldiers here are not even more than our soldiers here. Because our God is stronger. So this old man is telling the truth about God, about the world, about himself, that he trusts God. God. So tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. And the fourth one, I've mentioned it before, trust. What is the fourth one, everybody? Trust. Trust your children. Trust your children. And be consistent. This is the key. Be consistent in what you do so that we will learn how to trust from you from trusting you. If you are consistent in what you say, if you say this, and if you are consistent with this, we will trust you. And we will be trustworthy as well because we learn from you. Amen, everybody? Trust. Take notice. Be aware. What's the second one? Talking. Talking. What's the third one? Tooth. And the fourth one, trust. The fifth one to get today is togetherness. What, everybody? Togetherness. Let your child know that you are with them, which is closely tied, closely tied with talking. But this is really important because you are putting yourself in their team. Be with them, not against them. Which means when we talk to our, our, our children, we should not start with a negative statement. 
we should let them understand that we are with them in that problem. And listen to the prophet as he says, hey, he, those who are with us, have you seen that in the text? Those who are with us, the word us, means that the prophet is with this young man as he's facing his problem. With us, togetherness. Neither you or they, the children, are the enemy. We have a, a sole common enemy, and it's Satan. As family, you are working together, not pulling apart. And I understand that fa uh, the family relationship is always difficult. But let them know, let us know, let us know that you are with us, that you are in our team, that we're going to face this problem together, together. Six, touch. What, everybody? Touch. Children, uh, we young people need your physical touch, your hugs your kisses, your squeezes, and all kinds of appropriate touch. We need that. We need to feel that affection from a mother and from a male. We need that. We need that reassurance that you have this effect. <laughs> all right, all right. Some are practicing right now which is good. They are taking notes and doing it immediately. We need that touch. Just like Jesus touched this blind man and he felt this affection from someone who is God that he said, praise be to God, praise be to Jesus, son of David. That's what, that's what we want to feel when you are with us. We have problem. Parents, please give us that, that, that touch that touch that will tell us that you are actually caring about what's going on in our lives. Next one, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. An attitude of gratitude works both ways. Tell your children daily how thankful you are for them. And they'll begin to tell you the same thing. If you tell them that you are so important to, my, to me, I thank God that you are here. They will tell you the same thing. They will tell you the same thing. Next one, time. Time. Uh, children, we young people, we need you. Your presence. Remember I told them, value your parents' presence. So we need that presence. Your presence cannot be replaced by stuff. Your presence cannot be replaced by ice cream. Your, pre <laughs> Your presence cannot be replaced by toys. We need you. We really need you. You know, it's one thing. Some of the young people talk to me. And they felt that they want to present, they want to present the word of God during life. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Okay, you're going to do it. Okay, but this is my first time, Pastor, and I'm really afraid. And I told him, yes, I'm afraid too. But, but you're going to be okay. I'll be there. We're going to be there. That's the thing that they want, you, that you are there. Just to give that sense of assurance, that, that, that sense of someone is here as my support. We need your time. We need your full attention. We need you. Ninth, okay, I said ten, we are on the ninth, okay, uh, um, only one after this. The ninth is teaching. What, everybody? Teaching. teaching. You are your child's primary teacher. Not the school. Not LVJA. You are your primary. It doesn't mean that LVJA is not important. But you are your, the primary teacher of your child. God says it's a divine responsibility. You have a child. You have young people in this church. If you don't have a child, it's your divine responsibility to teach us. 
Teach us about church. Teach us about school. Teach us about life. Teach us about eating healthy. Teach us about playing sports the right way. Teach us about the world. But teach us about God. The last T is Trinity. Trinity. You are the child's first picture of who God is. This is what happens, and I observe this, and I hope you will agree with this. I pray that you will agree with this. You know, I've observed with my child that from her birth, she's, she's trying to understand her world. And because she couldn't speak yet, to say that she was hungry, she cried. So that was her form of, that was her, the way she communicated. To say that she, was, she, she felt pain when she was teething, she cried and she couldn't sleep. But then later on, as she was learning, how did she learn? She watched and observed what was going on at home. And at home, some people speak French. Some people speak different languages. Some people speak English. My wife and I speak several languages, and, and she was just like, what, what language am I going to speak? And she just confused everything, and she has one language with different languages in it. She speaks one sentence with French in it, with English in it, with Malagasy in it, with some other words in it, some Spanish in there. And we were like, what are you saying? But, but you know, she observed and she learned and she took all these things in and then she expresses it. So the first picture of who God is, is, is going to be you. They will understand, okay, this is my parents. They will look at you. They will learn from you. And then they'll learn, okay, there is a God. Must be like this parent that I have. So if you say to your child, hey, I will beat you if you don't do this, that will be their picture of who God is. If you say to your, to your, ch to your child, I love you and I would like you to choose this way instead of this way, that will be the picture of, of who God is. That will be how they perceive God. Brothers and sisters of mine, we have a divine responsibility. And I don't know why the Lord has put this in my heart today. But I had to speak about it. I don't know why. But brothers and sisters of mine, we have a divine responsibility. We are the face of God, an expression toward those children, to, to us young people. When we look at you, we think about God. Is that really how God is? Yes, it's a daunting task. It's something that is not easy. And I can testify, it's not easy to be a parent. <laughs> Especially when your three-year-old want to be independent. I have to remind her, she's three. <laughs> and somebody here told me during, a, during Wednesday night prayer, believe us, it's going to get worse. <laughs> and I said, really guys, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your encouragement. But that's what we need also as young parents. You know, those experiences that the, the, the other parents had before. We have a divine responsibility to share God with our, with our kids, with our young people. 
Jesus said to us that God is our Heavenly Father. And I thank God today how blessed we are to have a Father who is just, to have a Father who is perfect, to have a Father who is omnipresent, to have a Father who is omniscient, to have a Father who will always be there for us, who is on our side. He said, if God is with us, who can be against us? He has all the time for you. He has all the time for me. He has all the time for our children. He has, the time for, he has all the time for our grandchildren. We have a God. We have a God. We have a God who is loving and who is wonderful. God loves you. He gave his only begotten son for you. That's supreme love. He is calling us parents. He's calling us parents to show us young people, to show the kids his love. And we're not perfect. I understand that. We're just mere human beings. But why don't we take this advice from this story today? That when young people come to us, when our child come to us, we don't push them back because we are aware of what's going on in their life. Because we promise them that we will be with them. Because we say to them that we care. Because we say to them that we all have all the time for them. Because we taught them that there is a God in heaven who loves them so much. And that's why they're with us. Who loves them so much. That's why they will be with us eternally. Who loves them so much that he will come back just for us. And even if they did some mistakes before, if they made some bad choice before, we still love them. We still respect them. We are still with them because we are there to guide them. We are there to tell them the truth. We are there to help them make the right choice. We are there to love them just how God loves us. God always takes notice. God always talks with us. God always tells the truth. God is trustworthy. He will be together with us. He want to be together with us forever. He can touch us with his hands. His hands are not too short. His ears are not too deaf. He's there to touch us. He will affirm us with thanksgiving. He will spend time with us. He will teach us. Believe me, he will teach us. He is God, the Father. He is God, the Son. He is God, the Holy Spirit. Trinity, he is God, the Mighty One, the one who created the universe, the one who is ruler over the kings of the earth. He is God, the Almighty One. He loves you. He loves your child. And He loves every single one of us. Praise God, everybody, that He gave us an example so that we can lead our young people together so that we young people can value the presence of our parents. So that we young people can value the experience of our parents. So that we parents can make our young people know that we are there. That we love them. That we support them. That we spend time with them. That God loves them. So that God, the Almighty One, will take us together as a family, whatever you come from, wherever you come from, whatever langu language you're speaking, whatever texture of skin you have, whoever 
is your parents. God is calling each one of us as a big family. The Heavenly Father, brothers and sisters of mine, is calling you today as a big family to work with one another, to love one another, to support one another, to talk about God with one another, because He is ready. He is ready to take you home. He is ready to take me home. He is ready to take us home as a family, because He loves us so much that He will come back and will take us together forever in the paradise, the real paradise. We start here in Paradise Church, we will be together in the real paradise. Believe me, brothers and sisters of mine, this is the God whom we serve. This is the God whom we love. This is the God whom we serve. He is coming again. He is coming again. He is coming again. He is coming again. Amen. Amen.